Over and over the walls speak voices clear and without accent. Tell me what one so-called friend kept secret. A terrible penalty will be paid for trust. Oh, and to think I brought it into the house. Who was the Hecuba who believed good pot liquor could rule out genetic predisposition and nullify cradle to grave social abuse? Who was the Hecuba who could too? Midnights bring on poison sleep spells for success, fail and a wedding day bodes an abiding and relentless bleeding. Downfall will come with the muted cries of lock key kids his pleasure restricted to the pursuit of his dope-fed illusions and her deluded belief that not only can she overcome adversity, but bad advice and the jealousy of knaves. Their journey is a shock-ridden careen through a wasteland of slash wrists, amphetamines, and unscratchable itches. Their deep Hollywood story will come to its predic predictable ending, the rape of beauty, a secret bludgeoning, the death of an angel, three. But when the grim heart slips into its grimmer past of terror, shame, rage, where broken, dreamless nights are interred, there is no relief in pretense. Fantasy is an affront. Ordinariness was wanted yet denied. What was never learned in time proved the undoing. Mind be still. The crack up intensifies these recollections, resurrections, resurrecting the flood of a bitter spring. Four, you know it's your fault. You kept doing it when you should have stopped. You squandered irretri irretrievable bliss. The reason of you, the mirror says you, the highball glass contains you. Your face floats up from the ash and smoke at the end of your cigarette. The clock spun backwards around you. From behind the closed door, out you stepped you. Under the merciless light, you were revealed. These are the dark currents in which you do the butterfly stroke upstream. You, so rude and tender and strong, you are a guardian, no, a watchman, a watcher, no, a warden. You are what was so dearly paid for. You are the gas pedal to the floor. Your beauty is a maker of myths. On your tongue, piss turns to milk. You devastate me. Five. Do not remember, forget, a dream among objects outside that closed door of the rose wash room, framed against the doorway, a Queen Anne chair, the sitter waits in shadow. We did not meet. There was no entanglement of tongues. I did not experience love. Race did matter. And my hymen did not break. You were unconcerned about impressing anyone, <coughs> least of all my parents. Our stars did not cross. There is nothing to the past. Forget my name. So that's from this book again. Uh, if you're just joining us, we're talking about Wicked Enchantment. Um, this is the work of Wanda Coleman, poems selected by Terrence Hayes out on Black Sparrow Press, which uh, um, is a phenomenal press that has just been um, sort of reinvigorated with some great new titles. And I think this is their first title from that book. So um, thank you for listening to me read that piece. It meant a lot. Uh, and next up, we're going to hear from the incredible Mahogany L. Brown. Thank you. Um, I'll open with, um, uh, I just received this book after doing her um, celebration reading at Poets House, uh, The Love Project. And I hadn't seen these poems before from the section specifically The Wife. Um, I'm gonna read Ian or No One. Wind or voice of God. The well-traveled road out of Eden turns upon itself, oasis layers of elaborate multicolored sheets, the way flesh dampens and gives burst to salt in excessive heats 
dilated eyes roll up and inward to whiten, to circumscribe their own final shudderings, windows boarded up, nailed against intrusive, harsh, abusive sun against dust from unpaved roads, snaking, unwinding across 3,000 miles of concrete majesty and 50 odd years of thrashing up the Amazon of the soul to her narrow, darkened pathway, jungled down and threatening where she waits, breathing deeply air of hunger vamp, shaman, jihad, monger, mother of the city, maker of roads, her emotive tar sticky in the Ciroc can, blaze, captures the imprint of his eagerness, his steps, this traveler, fleeing holocaust, he's come in exploration, Hodge, the metropolis, this ageless romance, a shanker, a miracle, cause for shame, cause for glory, such fevers, such contradictions, neuroses. Is the glass half full or half empty, he asked. It depends on how thirsty I am, she answered. The road, ever onward, the traveler, naked and blind, nakedly blind, in lust and elongation that stiffens with satori drums, drumming intensifies the act and unwinding, turning in into her pomegranate eyes, her raven mouth, the cave of the giver, crypt of the taker, her holy hole through which he simons. Pain enduring faced labor, the byproduct of their night's cabal, the child stuff suction from her womb into necrotic blackness, ever stillborn harmony, the abortion disembowelment of song, frustrated, choked by the twisted umbuculus of hate, his hardness, the stubborn thrust which storm her eyes flood, her backwater dirt roads to spiritual El Dorados, the greedy claw of anger mauling her slave's heart, as abusive as that urban sun, endless poverty, her eyes closed in wonder, submission to his davening, the, the savor of his red sweat stinging, her bluesy lips, his hazel eyes, relentless. Harmatins, he mounts, he enters, he descends, as on sheets, twisted back on butt-weary mattresses, stinking of generations, of excess, demands tongue, and again tongue, their frictions, one traveling flesh of the other, over and over, this ritual, coitus rendering of delirium well and I'm, <laughs> right and so because i am originally from california i did not know of the magnificence that was Juan de Coman until i got to new york and i started off with the punani poets so when i read that i was like well i just might as well go back home a little bit so <laughs> thank you for letting me read that and and i just really like listen um to to people talk about her and I, I'm reading her poems again and again and I love how black and woman and sexual she was and 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 she took up space and was so proud and that gives me so much joy because there are so many moments where I, I forget that our poems can can do that kind of miraculous work and she does it effortlessly. Pigging out. At the restaurant we sit down to wine we are so hungry. The crisp appetizers, early loves and lightly seasoned salad, we've developed appetites for the garlic and onion of life, gorging on a main course of dissatisfaction. Over frustrated creativity sauteed in economic plight. He chews over his, bro his Brooklyn childhood. I pick at the tedium of youthful Watts summers. We eat away the lousy jobs stunting our talent. We eat away the hot, smog-filled day. We eat away the war in the headlines. We eat away the threat of nuclear holocaust. We eat away love threatening pressures. We eat away the human pain we see, feel, are stymied by. Pride is such thin dessert. We eat until our smiles return, until fat and happy. <laughs> I'm, 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 I want that right now. I want to eat away the COVID-19. I want to eat away all that. And I'm going to close with Mama, number four. 
<clears throat> when did we become friends? It happened so gradual, I didn't notice. Maybe I had to get my run out first, take a big bite of the hunky world and choke on it. Maybe that's what has to happen with some uppity youngsters if it happens at all. And now the thoughts start and irrevocable, irre irre sorry. The thoughts start and irrevocable irre of being here without you shakes me beyond love, fear, regret, or anger into that realm children go who want to care for, protect their parents as if they could, and sometimes the lucky ones do, into the realm of making every moment important, laughing as though laughter wards off death, each word given, received like Spanish eight, treasure to bury within, against that shadow day, when it will be the only coin I possess with which to buy peace of mind. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you. We love you, Mo. We love, love you, Mo. You Beautiful. So uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Dorothy Lasky. Oh, you got to unmute yourself. Oh, God. There you go. <laughs> I have used Zoom before, but maybe not. But um, I just love, <laughs> I love being here. I love that we're doing this. It's so, you know, exciting to celebrate this beautiful book and just to be together reading these poems, I think is, you know, truly whatever. I can't think of a better word than magical, so I'll just say it. But um, yeah, so I'm going to read two poems um, from this beautiful new book. Um, and uh, the first one I'm going to read is called Hornets on page 200 for those of you following at home. Um, and it's After the Song by Herbie Hancock. Ghost lovers, those old urges and furious forward, tongue and veiny hard on, stingers, strokers, stumble bums, thunder jolts and mad hens, all decisions are wrong. Two thirds stomach, a will of its own. Pick a month like January, lay out the days, a crazed calendar, a snowless chill. Bad wind, you say, buzz it. Oxygen starved lungs, which have become scream weakened. Never ending list of ripoffs. It's all fuck daddies and parasites roiling in the gut bucket like breaded and fried deep dish in Rex lard, a river of fat in which gizzards hush puppies and thoughts are browned. Eyes wide as magnolia blossoms, limbs askew but sinewy and glutted on touch them thigh bones, pot liquor laced with spit and Johnny Walker black. Ham hock sprouting mid bowl in butter beans. You know you're just a greedy so and so. Working chain rhymes, stringing nostrums like beads. You say chapter and verse. This is the way they do it to you here. That which doesn't sting you, stupid, makes you cynical, bugged. But for the light of it all, mean things winging in the green. The swelling comes heavy, calm stifled in folds of irritated Jones maddened meat, a dull buzz to the quick, then the marrow, capillaries bursting like st star orchids, an itchless rash webbing the skin as if an acid burn, scars puffed up full, rise as big as confessions of attempted excellence. Roundness rages, bones in retreat, Order rules on its own as the abyss sets behind voluminous cheeks. Major bloat signals the decline in bull to shoot. Soft tissue damage. Cash cows belly up in lost focus as you practice the science of floating in one's own waste. I love that poem so much. Um, it reminds me of one of my favorite poems by Anne Sexton called The Hornet. I don't know if everyone's um, read that, but if you haven't, you might like it, like to read them both together. Um, and I'm going to also read a poem called Consciousness Raising Exercise, which is after Elizabeth Bishop. 
Think of the tornado roaming the nation uneasily, like tall blonde boys in black coats with semi-automatics taking names in a high school library. Think how they must look now, the rotted innocents, thinking they were safe, slain before they had the chances most take for comfort, if not for granted. Whose families will forever mourn by the light of their face are the fire of their estrangements. Think of the past walk to the crossroads, the solemn pledges, the good done, the vows, the smiles, revealed in photograph albums and mementos, small things kept to stay the flood. It's raining dirty water all over America. The hearths of thousands are broken with countless fireplaces, cracked and gone to weed. The arcs are slowly filling with unknown species and new breeds. What happened to the brave? Have they departed with the free? Think of the gutters crammed with souls gone needlessly to waste. Think of hundreds seeping in history's tar as still as redwood or mounds of shoes. Think of them deeply injured as disturbances unresolved. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dottie. Um, so surreal for poets who are always like drinking together and loud and obnoxious and just that's just you amber just sorry, excuse me you're right that's fair i was gonna say touching we touch though right like, like consensual touching that happens on that yeah fine rachel look at her face she's like no don't touch me do not touch me ever <laughs> um speaking of rachel uh next up we have uh, Rachel McKibbins, the one and only. How do you get it to where it's not uh, reversed? When you hold up the book, Amber. I know. Not, what the fuck? It's not, it's not reversed when you hold it up. It Whoa. is. A, Rach, no. It it's is not. Is, it, it is for it's me. Fine. This is weird. All it's, right. I'm looking into it. I'm, who cares? I, <laughs> I'm going to read things no oh, one knows. Please. I feel like it's really... I mean, all of Wanda's poems are pretty relevant. They're timeless, which is what I truly love. And um, she just was never shy away from using the proper language, right? Instead of the more floral language. Um, I'm just gonna dive into it. Things no one knows. Overcome by the stink of mildewed wash, I've been three months behind in my rent for 30 years. My countrymen do not love me. Even my lines have lines. We are getting old in a city where the old are invisible. I have nothing new to eat and barely five minutes to use this jing, and less time than that to revisit my father's grave. I've worn the same underwear for 15 of those 30 years, and some pieces longer than that. Writing friends is a luxury, enemies a necessity. My car was stripped and stolen months ago and I have no money with which to repair or replace it. My mentors have exiled me to the outskirts of nappy literacy. My wallet is dying of militant brain cancer. My lust for my country is frigid. The light excludes me, and there is no degree for what is learned in the dark. I am too clumsy to steal big. There is a boogeyman in New York City who conspires against and spreads rumors about my lost lip. I'm so economically crippled, even my begging cup has mold sprouting in its well. My son has mistaken me for a dragon, and his history teachers keep trying to hose out these flames in my mouth. I do not attend my high school class reunions because too many of my classmates died in Vietnam or in the liquor lockers of America or in those classrooms long ago. There is a boogie woman in Oberlin who conspires against me, her jealousy inspired by Im my imaginary imaginings. I am trapped in the hold of my greedy grief and expect to keep circling. I expect my son to escape and my husband to die during exquisite crisis. The Federal Bureau of Pajamas is after my hot cross bun. <laughs> I expect to awaken from sleep soon. I expect my banana nut bread to go stale and uneaten. I expect to die poemless and to be cremated in state ovens. 
I expect my ashes to be scattered like pollen, to take wing on the wind like butterflies. I want to read this for the opening poem. It was a beautiful choice uh, to open with Wanda in Worryland. Um, I, the, my favorite thing about books is how they start and how they close. And this is a perfect, in my opinion, uh, this book opens and closes beautifully, exquisitely. Wanda in Worryland. I get scared sometimes and have to go look into the closet to see if his clothes are still there. I've been known to imagine a situation and that then get involved in it, upset, angry, and cry hot tears. I've gone after people with guns. Once I tried to hang myself and got terribly ashamed afterwards because I was really faking it. I've gone after people with rocks. I've cursed out old white lady cart pushers in supermarkets who block the aisles in slow motion. I've gone after people with my fists. I've walked out on Pavlovian trainers who mistook me for a dog. I go to sleep and have dreams about falling and can't stand the suspense so I sweat it out and land on my feet. I've gone after people with poems. I get scared sometimes and I have to go look into the mirror to see if I'm still there. I'm gonna close with this shorty called Obituary after Denise Levertov. The unread poems of true poets are sad. No one should go, no one should love so hard in vain and go unnoticed. This sunset should trouble the sky. Rip the curtains from the windows and shout, it's their fault. The craven curs around and around and all fall down everywhere. The gut rending sound of cogs grinding and poets felled silent. If the empty only feed the empty, the reign of apathy will go on and Moloch's triumph. True poets will go on, unread, eking out a space at the mean end of time. They will bear their teeth and spring at the moon. The end. Gone, wow. Rachel. Yes. Thank you, Rachel. Man, that last poem. Um, Next up, we've got uh, Patricia Smith. Hi, Patricia. Hi, Amber. Hi, baby. Um, so, actually, thank you so much. And Terrence, thank you for this book. This is just what was missing. It's a perfect introduction to Wanda's work. Because if you have it all, you're going to need like five shelves. But this is, this is essential for everyone. Yeah, let's keep doing that. Yeah. Um, Rachel, hold, your, hold yours up because it's not oh, back. Okay, it's, it's right? Yeah. Okay. Is, I don't know. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to read two short ones and one medium one. Okay. And I just found one. <laughs> so uh, this is Dream 924. The trip starts on the limitless freeway of my thoughts. The tank is full. I am behind the wheel moving with the undisturbed swiftness. I feel the sigh of the engine, emanations through the floor. My foot against the accelerator rises and falls as I pass first on the left, then on the right. Swooping, lights bobble in the fluid ink of night, amber, white, and red street stars. There is other life out there. I sense it, a smell, a heat rising from my skin. I'm hugged in my black leather jacket, a perfect fit, and fingerless black calfskin gloves. My black kinks porcupine my scalp thickly, wild. My ears are clamped in gold. My big hips hug the contoured seat and I reach for the fake gear shift because this vehicle really has an automatic transmission. And I'm fine as the speedometer needle presses urgently against the edge. Ah, the power. I am looking for the answer. And I move forward, my eyes scoping the horizon as though a pinball, pinball course. And I know he's out here somewhere, dead ahead, enemy and lover. I am armed, the Beretta snug in the confines of my jacket. I think briefly of the law. What if they give chase? But I've outrun them before. I did not wake up today. And... Da -da 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 -da. I feel like she's looking at this and just kind of laughing. There's a big blunt and anyway. <laughs> oh, go 
okay, so 204. Sorry about this. Don't you hate when quotes do this? No, right. I need it so much. <laughs> the queen on her color. The useless savior finds me nailed to a rusty junkyard chassis. I have outlived the light. Sightseers once came in proud waves. Laughter rang on the hilltops and multi-hued chatter filled this basin with breathy desire. Young days have a habit of quarrelsome gifts and confusions, of promises half meant, half kept, of finding joy in flawed self-revelations. Days are like that, as if you didn't know. That blasphemy, that brightness, left dots before my eyes and burnt off my lashes. A few respected enemies to chat with, art for brains, and stoked on freedom's promise. The kind of bull tripe and betrayal I've had a belly full of. Wrote like a nigger, got paid like a Mexican. You know who I am in your bones and why you must hate me. Words. Thoughtless snipes, your cruelty and you and I see as I see a beauty as your Norwegian North. We argued and I will never forget your words. The sheltering night finds me stranded on a vacant lot in the city of my dishonor and abuse. Your smile is turned away, the sounds that compose your name, a bizarre cacophony. These are the broken memories you have left me. I turn them over in the gravel, I lose them, I find them, I feed them to stray cats who vomit up fur balls and bits of your falcon. My rich, dark life, I must stain you somehow. I must make enchantments from those broken memories you've left me. I want your hidden envy, your bitter, bitter smile, that greedy, haunted regret your ugly mirror hoards. What can I seduce you with? I offer you alleyways, bitter sunrises, the unapologetic blaze of urban hope. I offer you the sweet darkness of a woman who has looked too long into her lonely tarot. I offer you my slave ancestors, my beloved dead, the beauty living men has dis have dishonored in headlines, my father's terror of being lynched from the church steeples of Little Rock, Arkansas, my maternal grand great grandmother's calloused feet after her walk along the trail of tears from Tennessee to Oklahoma territory, my maternal grandfather's miserly diggings in the dead of history to hide his fortune from his children, my cousin, just 25, found dead in the workplace, her heart having stopped to leave her leaning over an indifferent corporate accounts ledger. I offer you whatever incites my blood, whatever incurs my wrath or stirs my vision. I offer you the spurned loyalty of a woman who has been the stupid loyal fool. I offer you that kernel of myself, that unwanted playmate, that central core that deals not in dreams, but traffics in pain and is undiminished with time, knows no enjoyment, a wellspring of adversaries. I offer you the memory of stolen virginity, a rose violated under a mother's vigilant fear. I offer you spells to relieve emptiness, incantations to calm troubles, surprising magics to delight the tongue and eye. I give you my graciousness, my roundness, the feast of my words. I am trying to bribe you with certainty, with deliciousness, with victory. I think that's enough time. Thank you. Patricia, if you want to read one more, we're good on time. It's up to you. Are you sure? Yeah, babe, you're good. Read one more. One more short one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Please. Everybody who's out there. Wanda, why aren't you dead? Ooh, this is a good one. Wanda, when are you going to wear your hair down? Wanda, that's a whore's name. Wanda, why ain't you rich? Wanda, you know no man in his right mind want a ready-made family. Why don't you lose weight? Wanda, why are you so angry? How come your feet are so goddamn big? Uh, uh, can't you afford to move out of this hell hole? If I were you, were you, uh, were you, Wanda, what is it like being black? I hear you don't like black men. Tell me you're ACDC. Tell me you're a nympho. Tell me you're into chains. Wanda, I, I, I don't think you really mean that. You joking, girl. You crazy. Wanda, what makes you so angry? 
Wanda, I think you need this. Wanda, you have no humor in you. you. You're too serious. Wanda, I didn't know I was hurting you. That was an accident. Wanda, I know what you're thinking. Wanda, I don't think they'll take that off of you. Wanda, why are you so angry? I I'm sorry, I didn't remember that, 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 or that was so important to you. Wanda, you are always on the attack. Wanda, 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 I wonder, why ain't you dead? <laughs> Boy, am I glad you read that. <laughs> Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, so we're going to close out here, um, leaving on that note with, um, with Terrence, Terrence Hayes, who is the editor of this book, the, um, the selector of these poems. Uh, and I guess I would, I would love to hear Terrence and um, Joshua, who is... Um, also one of the editors and works for Black Throw Press and a phenomenal champion of um, Wanda's work. If you guys wanna be sort of conversation a little bit about the inception of this book, um, how it came about, why it's important, and uh, just tell, give us a little bit of the history. And again, for those joining, we're talking about this book. Rachel, help me, put it up. Rachel's is not sure, back, Wanda. I don't know why. I'm gonna show Terrence's art here. Neither is Patricia's. Mine's not backwards. Yeah, it looks backwards, backwards when I look at it. Nobody's in the Mine's the best. Um, and that's the inside, beautiful. So if you guys want to talk a little bit, go ahead. I, I do want to read a little bit. Um, yeah, of course, that too. Just a couple poems. You want me to read first or read Whatever after? Whatever you want, it's your time, you do it. Uh, well, yeah, let me, let me get, go what I have here. Um, I'll just read like a, a couple of sentences from the intro, which sets us up. That, it was such a great poem to end with. All of the selections were, were great. Uh, it's so good to be here with y'all tonight. Amber, you're really the mastermind behind this. I appreciate it. And it seems <laughs> like I'm smart enough to organize something like this or help. I'm not. I'm just showing up. Um, here's a little part of uh, the intro. Her poems often record the mood of one who feels exiled, discounted, neglected. Imagine how mean the famously mean Miles Davis might have been had no one taken his horn playing seriously and you will have a sense of Wanda's rage. I think some of it was misplaced. She had legions of fans, and then I list people. So just read that part, because that was part of it. Uh, she, I don't think she ever quite knew how many people loved her. I kind of felt like, I'll tell you every day <laughs> if you need to hear it. Um, but the other side of that is you just get this kind of edge in the poems that you just can't get anywhere else, uh, because she's just writing so mercifully and mercilessly you know, into the world, out of her feelings. So at the end of the intro, I just really wanted to include her own words because, you know, that is pretty much how she represented herself in the world. She never wanted anybody to speak for her. So I'll read a couple of these and then a handful of poems and we can talk. Um, so these, these excerpts come from The Ride Inside Me, which was also on Black Spiral Press in 2005, so not even that long ago. Um, I hope you check that out if you have a way to get to, that, to some of those uh, essays. So here's the one part of it. I just love about her, the range of her taste in music and the Hornets is mentioned here. That poem is, uh, that love is mentioned here, uh, Dottie. In the 70s, divorced and on my own, I danced at the discos, dug on Black Sabbath, David Bowie and Alice Cooper. I interviewed Bob Marley, Catch a Fire, on three occasions and made the St. Patrick's Day riots at Elks Hall when New Wave stormed Los Angeles. Yet I began wearing the grooves off my Bobby Blue Bland, Taj Mahal and Otis Redding LPs. I was a devotee of Herbie Hancock, Hornets, thrice catching him cross town at Doug Weston's Troubadour. While listening, I'm able to visualize fingering, particularly piano and guitar instruments I've studied. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in there, including that she interviewed Bob Marley three times. Like, what? Um, here's something about how she thinks about her own work, looking for it, an interview. I'm not about shock. If any shock is present, it's the shock of recognition or the shock of understanding, but I'm not deliberately out to just shock people. I'm not about being sensationalistic. I want freedom when I write. I want the freedom to use any kind of language, whatever I feel is appropriate to get the point across. And this last little part, I'm just doing a sort of like sweep across 
So this ends up in the 90s, where she really makes this decision about being a poet. And this is from the title essay, uh, The Ride Inside Me. In 1991, following the death of my father, I took a major risk and quit my slave as medical secretary, encouraged by my third husband of 10 years. The pull of my gift could no longer be denied. I had to write regardless. I was in my mid 40s. Other than temporary layoffs, it was the first time since 1972 that I had been without a regular paycheck. Ahead lay disaster, spun from the ever complex machinations of race. On April 29, 1992, as I left a late morning meeting at the Department of Cultural Affairs, the verdict by the Simi Valley jury in the Rodney King beating case was announced. By the time I arrived home, the city was in flames. And then the last little excerpt from this same essay, how she ends the whole essay, actually. What does a poet do when poetry is the most underappreciated art in the nation, even considered subversive? Being who I am, I can't not make note of the ironies of the arrogance governing our nation's rhetoric. I decided I had to get out of the house and drive out to the cemetery. I had not visited my father's grave in over a year. I did as usual, took grass clippers, a rag, bottle of water, got down on my knees and tied it up, asking as I always do, the unanswerable. So there's just a lot in there. Uh, I mean, she wrote in all kinds of genres, so um, she could pretty much do it all, to tell you the truth. Okay, so I'm always reading these sonnets, and I even have one here that I haven't read before. But before I do that, I'm going to read you this Naruto poem. Like, obviously, she was extremely uh, well-read. She was drawn from everywhere. So we heard a couple of excerpts, the Elizabeth Bishop imitation tonight, uh, Baraka, Komen Yaka, I mean, anybody. I, I said in the intro, including myself. So she just read broadly, and it was extremely generous in how she received other styles and other poets. So this poem is just a Neruda poem um, on page 99. It's called Neruda. Few quiet hours, I spent them soaking in the tub with my Neruda. In a dream, a bearded Monero stranger approaches me along a dark street in the plaza. As we pass, he whispers hoarsely, Neruda. While my lover takes siesta, I walk down to the neighborhood bar for a game of pool solo. I order dos besos. I put a quarter in the juke and notice all selections read Neruda. While standing at the supermarket checkout stand, I read tabloid headlines. One screams, man force feeds wife Neruda. He tells me he's worried Neruda is coming between us. Note found in Cantonese fortune cookie. Neruda slept here. Um, so I'm just doing all her different, her tones. So I think I'm going to read American Sonnet number 95, which again, anytime I flip through the book, I can find something to read for y'all. So I hadn't read this one before, but I just for some reason was struck by its, uh, you know, its tenderness. It's like, it's a real, it's American Sonnet number five. It's her getting to like the love impulse in the sonnet. And I'll read you a American Sonnet number 71, where she does a whole other thing with the form. So this is 75. My recalcitrant darling, what do I mean about you? Arms unraveling, becoming independent again. The four-legged, fur-tongued night beast struggles towards liberation's light, groping through a dense and bird lingua erotica, lost in fact, and feeding on whatever's digestible. I seek another way to say it, like leaning on vital establishments. I leap on the vibrantly evervescent as longing orders visionary efforts, and in labor's oily, viscous emissions lick over various events. Shade encounters, black and red for mood, a la gambling on the curtive nature of release. I'm going off for a few days to find my way back to you the way I must be. Rule out happy, for without you, how am I to be who I've become? Um, this is American Sonnet number 71. Uh, the question is like, who's speaking this? Who's giving the instructions? Uh, OK, so let me just read it to you. American Sonnet number 71. First, you must prove that you can sing while running backwards. 
Good. Now prove that you can read underwater. Excellent. Not a bad ankle grabber when you use your lower lip. Okay, now let's see how you handle a wallet, bank account, taxes, bankruptcy. Terrific. Quick, study. Got one for you. Do it all twice as fast with one eye tied behind your back. Damn. Now do it all even faster than that with one eye between your legs and both hands cuffed at your knees. Bravo. No, you don't have to stand on your head, not yet. But now I'd like to see you do all that while hanging from monkey bars by your big toes. No shoes. Ooh. Now drop them. Drop them. Oh well, that settles it. Unfair competition. You got a lot of balls there, cunt teeth, but no cock. I have never seen the word cunt teeth in a poem and probably will never see it again in a poem. Only Wanda Coleman would like, could do it, the nerve. And it's just a brilliant poem too. So I said like, who's speaking it? Because you know, sometimes I'm like, she wants a man to read it because that's it, you know, but it's just so many different tones in it. Uh, it's just great. Okay. Two more and then we can talk. I'll read this, this one and I'll read the one that uh, I did the title from and then talk a little bit to Joshua about, you know, this occasion. So this is American Sonnet number 94. Nostrum nostalgia, my notes on nada, no, collect against my reluctance. Forced tabulations. They did this, says me, and that, and that there. Why have there been no arrest, no hearings, no justice? What is not offered cannot be refused. I regress, the despoiled child, the deserted schoolyard. Weeper, this is your execution. Weeper, this is your groveling stone. Weeper, yours is the burst and burnings of a city. Stunned, tearless in the uselessness of limp pursuit, breathlessness besets and brings the ass earthward. Rest. The answer yellows and loses its wit, its crispness, my bed to make, my heart to stake, my soul to take. How I committed suicide. I revealed myself to you. I trusted you. I forgot the color of my birth. And uh, yeah, this is the one that uh, I, I took the title from. I think it's all, I mean, they're all Ars Poeticas, but. Um, yeah, this is a good one. Assign it, American Sonnet number 95. Seized by wicked enchantment, I surrendered my song. As I fled for the stars, I saw an earth child in a distant hallway crying out to his mother. Please don't go away and leave us. He was, I saw, my son. Immediately, I discontinued my flight. From here, I can see the clock tower in a sweep of light framed by wild ivy. It pierces all nights to come. I haunt these chambers, but they belong to cruel, churchified insects. Among the books, mine go unread, dust covered. I write about urban bleeders and breeders, but am troubled because their tragedies echo mine. At this moment, I am sickened by the urge to smash. My thighs present themselves, stillborn, misshapen wings within me. All right, y'all. Um, can, it, can everybody come on? Maybe we can all talk together. I was like, yeah, yeah. Come yeah, in, so unmute so that way we don't have to like, you know, let's just talk all together. Y'all got questions, we can answer it. It'd be nicer to hear everybody's voices here at the end. So uh, I know Joshua was in there somewhere. Uh, Dottie, Patricia, Rachel, Amber, thank y'all. Um, I think Mo left yet. But yeah, let's talk. Um, honored to do it. Again, you know, obviously, uh, well, I don't know, obviously, she's always been a, a huge 
a huge guy. Uh, I came through her through her poems. Um, I put her in those, one of those plowshares way back in the day when I edited one of those. And we would, you know, we would just send uh, emails occasionally back and forth. But again, I would say that, you know, I'm a fan like everybody else. And I sort of feel like even now, my role is really just to let her know that we love her. I mean, yeah, yeah. so much energy comes out of her feeling overlooked. And, you know, she was, as I said, she wasn't all the way wrong. Some of it's that West Coast thing. I think it's hard for a West Coast poet to kind of like get over to this coast. Some of it was her attitude. I mean, she she burned a lot of bridges. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Davis, obviously Maya Angelou. She stood by her principles, though. So she recognized that she there was going to be a price for who she was. But she put all of that in the poems. I mean, I, I'm not saying she ever whined about it. I think she turned it into like energy. She turned it into like bite. And that's why we get these kinds of amazing poems that I just, for me, uh, what she gives me, I can't get anywhere else, you know? And that's a hard thing to say in such a populated and beautifully diverse uh, poetic landscape to actually come to somebody and be like, wow, this is, a, this is one of those colors you ain't getting nowhere else, you know? And yet, so important. So that's what I have to say about her. Yeah. Uh, is Josh coming in? I mean, um, all I really wanted to kind of reiterate was the clarity on like it's Godine, and I, I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Like when Black Sparrow sort of stopped, I know that like um, I got Wanda on the pit press after she left Black Sparrow, so I'm not clear. I mean, but she was publishing still into the early 2000s, that first decade with Black Sparrow. But when they closed down, a lot of people didn't have any place to go. I mean. When I think about the whole press, I still think about, obviously, Bukowski. Uh, there's so many great poets, Diane Wachowski, so many poets in that stable. I'm glad that Wanda's the first one they're bringing out. Obviously, she's totally perfect. Um, but I hope it signals that they're bringing everybody else back, too, because um, it was just so much good poetry. What I said about my selection process is that, you know, I believe, this is why I wanted Josh in here, I believe they were getting published by the thickness of the books. I believe John Martin's still around somewhere, too. So, yeah. you know, because it was her primary, uh, one of her primary modes of regular income, she was putting out thick ass books. So <laughs> they, were they were uneven. She knew that they were uneven. And she was writing out of a place of like, you know, writing to survive. So that question of good and bad just really wasn't anything that was ever going to stop her if you follow me. And I think that's the best way to write, to not get too precious about it, just to write what you got to write. But that made my job so easy because it's so many books, so much poetry. And all I did was, it's like, you know, uh, Michelangelo says, find a David inside of the marble. I'm like, you're just finding the David inside of the David. Like, it was already there. The work is just waiting on you when you go look for it. So I didn't think that this was at all hard uh, for me to do. And thank you all for reading so many great selections. Um, I hope it, again, I hope it does what we needed to do, which is, like, make sure she knows that she's important to all of us, that she won't be forgotten. She's got a whole bunch of new poets to teach. And so we're going to put it out there for them so they can find it. Yeah, I think, I think for a lot of the LA poets too, that there was, um, like myself, who were born and raised there and read with her at Beyond Maroke, um, read with her at a lot of venues in California. Um, I, know, I, I know that I feel like I took her presence for granted. I, I feel like a lot of poets feel that way mm -hmm. um, now that she's gone and that her work was sort of a driving factor for so many poets and their voices. Um, and so I feel very similar to you, Terrence, in the sense of wanting to keep her work alive and reminding people of so many of us who were influenced by her, where that in came from directly, because I think it's so easy to, you know, in the, the poem that I think Patricia read where she's, um, I can't remember the one that you just read, but the, where she talks about like no one reading her books, which is like every poet's worst fear, right? Like no one cares, no matter how great you are, no matter what you pour into your work, no one's ever going to read it. Um, and I think she really, really struggled with that a lot. Um, so it, it matters deeply. I think that we're all continuing to push the legacy and remind people of where a lot of that Southern California swagger came from. Yeah. The, uh Amber, do you remember a recording uh, company uh, that used to put out a lot of the L.A. Poet CDs? I can't remember the name of it now, but I found it and I collected so much stuff. And there was a, um, there was a CD with Wanda and there were things on it like Logan's Run and... Uh, yeah. 
yeah, I can't remember what it was, but there was this real chasm between the East and the West. Yeah. I found those first and it was the performance aspect. I hadn't seen any of her books. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I talked about at AWP, uh, driving cross country and I saw Naropa and had never gone to Naropa mm -hmm. and said, hey, you know, eh, let's go. And she was there and there were no other black folks there at all. And I had never seen anybody. She did They Will Starve You, right? Mm -hmm. I had never seen anybody hold a room full of people in her hand. I mean, she could have killed them all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd never seen anything like that, you know? So what I came upon first was that performative aspect. And that made me look up the work. It was the CD. And they were all coming out of LA. I can't remember the name of the Oh, look at that. Can, is that it? Is that the one? Oh, no? my God. <laughs> that's not it? Is that it or no? That's, no. That's, what's on that? Uh, Wanda, why aren't you dead yet? Emmett Till, uh, I Love the Dark. I don't know what year it is, Dolls. What's the company, Terrence, does it say? Um, New Alliance Records. I think that uh, might I think that might be it. Lawndale, California. Yeah, no, there was, I got another one. I don't have that one. There was mm -hmm. another one um, that uh, had Logan's Run on it. I right. can't remember. I've been trying to find another one ever since. But yeah, it was that, it was that. It was like the, her voice was so different from anything I was hearing East. Mm -hmm. uh, anything I was hearing, you know, when I was tied up in the slam and everything like that, it was just the, what Terrence said about her pouring all of her work into, you know, this is my life, this is my living. Her voice had that quality to it. It was like, you're going to like it or you're not going to like it, but it's going to be out here just like this. Right. That's right. You know? Yeah. And then this, and later when I found the books and saw how thick the books were, I wasn't thinking, oh, this is all. I said, oh, my gosh, she's got so much great work that she can't get it out fast enough. <laughs> she, the money was helping, a, motiv a motivator. <laughs> uh, Joshua, maybe you coming in. Did I cover everything appropriately? I hope I did in terms of- Yeah, you're being a little too humble though. I mean, Terrence, Terrence took the stack of books like, I can't get my hands far enough back. I sent him this major box and uh, he wasn't skimming, man. He reread everything in order to boil it down because we discussed a bunch about, you know, if one, if we put out Wanda's collected, it would be, you know, five volumes or 500 pages each or something. So we really wanted this to feel like it was approachable to people who didn't know Wanda's work as an introduction. Um, and I've been racing because the, you know, Wanda's first book with Black Sparrow was in 1979. It was set in metal type and letterpress printed. So there's no, you know, PDF to reprint that quickly. So we've been racing to, um, to scan and reset all of her back catalog. So that's all available. Um, she's one of the very small groups I consider like the core of Black Sparrow Press. Yeah. You know, Terrence James, Mothers, Kowski, Wilkowski, Tom Clark. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to do two things in tandem with Black Sparrow now, which is uh, reintroduce these classic key authors while at the same time bringing out brand new authors who have never been on Black Sparrow. Like Susan Barber's Geode came out today, cool. and Lee McLaughlin's Summer Solstice, which is this sweet little book, comes out uh, at the end of the month. There are two new, brand new Black Sparrow authors. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you real quick the Black Sparrow story, because Terrence was at a little bit about the timeline. So 1966, Black Sparrow starts in Los Angeles. 1970, David R. Godin starts in Boston. They're both sort of similar personalities, John Martin and David Godin, but doing you know this parallel East Coast, West Coast thing. Um, John Martin decides to retire in 2002. And you know he had this warehouse in Santa Rosa and all these authors that he cared so much about. John's really, you know, he's the other person that's, that's the really key to this book. You know, he really, Wanda talks about him in some of those um, right inside the essays. He wasn't just her publisher, you know, he cared about her work, he cared about her. He was always trying to sort of shepherd her along. Um, <clears throat> so he did the same thing when he retired in 2002. He reached out to another independent publisher that he thought would care about these books. So they all went in tractor trailer trucks from Santa Rosa to New Hampshire and um, John retired. So from 2002 to now, Black Sparrow has been around. It's just been a little bit quiet 
and my decision was to, to make it loud again and in part wow i didn't know that to look back John Martin is still with us. He's about to turn 90. I was just with him in the uh, It was amazing. And, and, and whenever Terrence and I had a question, you know, one of the hardest things is that we couldn't turn to Wanda. So I, I was turning to John a bunch. Um, who pointed out, um, Rachel, did you point out the first poem in the book? I think it was yes. you. Uh -huh. That's the only poem. I went to John and I said, Terrence and I don't know about sequence here. And John said, oh, Wanda was so careful about her sequencing. You yeah. better leave yeah, so we did, um, except for the first poem. We both right. decided this is the first poem. Yeah, yeah I just put them, I put them in the order that they were published, and it still makes such a perfect sense. And right, that oh, yeah. poem is clear to be led off with. But it is her. I mean, if I'm clear about anything in that intro, is that I'm trying to say, no way could I speak on her, you know, on her behalf. I can only sort of, you know, curtsy to her or hold the door open for her because that's what she was about. Like. Um, she, she's still here. She's still very loudly speaking to us. So I think that about the book. I mean, it's good for me because I, I don't feel like I really had to do much. I know that it was all, you know, just sort of organizing it, putting it in order, but it was her, it was her work and her presence. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you guys so much for honoring her. Like thank this. you. Great. Right, yeah. Okay. I just, just really quickly. The, mm -hmm. um, the CD was the year after High Priestess. It's called Berserk on Hollywood Boulevard. Oh, uh, is it the same um, company? Uh, New Alliance again. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and there's there's a uh, black and blue news. And she was making, there's one on New Alliance that she made with M Michelle T. Clinton. Yeah, yeah. Exine yeah. Cervenka. Exine Cervenka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lydia, Lydia Lunch had been on that same one too. Uh, not oh, on that uh, CD, but on that, uh, the prep, not press, what the fuck is it called? Label. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's worth hunting those things down. I'd yeah. love to get those. Right. What's great is that was like an LA punk label. <laughs> right, for sure. Yeah. And you would always get like a burned CD of a burned CD. Like, <laughs> 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 all the money for like the legit one and then you all made copies. <laughs> yep, that's right. I mean, she was really punk rock. I think a lot of folks don't really get yeah, that's why I read that little excerpt where she's calling out Bowie and Alice Cooper word know. exactly yeah. you know and um I think the way she straddled where she came from you know Watts what had a notorious reputation right. um and then being able to I mean I I think that a lot of people mention her rage a lot but it it, it was just so much heart you know and mm -hmm. I just wanted, wanting to not that it was transactional, but just wanting to get back some of the, you know, moxie and love that she put out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when you don't feel like that's matched, it, it can it can make you a little batty. I mean, I, I've, I've watched it with a lot of LA poets, but Wanda Coleman was definitely, I, I totally relate to what Amber was saying in that she just was always there. And so you just didn't think to stop and really, um, you know, fully like allow yourself to to truly get invested in just who she was as an entire person but also like the the lineage that she had with her um because she just was a staple of the los angeles poetry scene and um i think that she felt aged out for a while too yes um when more of the spoken word yeah the spoken word and hbo stuff started happening and uh you know, I mean, it, it's still common to this day, like for, you know, for ageism. And that's why I specifically wanted to read the one poem um, about that, about, you know, becoming invisible as you mm -hmm. get older. Mm -hmm. Things no one, uh, things no one knows. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah, so true. And funny. I mean, the thing about that, uh, how she channels it, that's what's so great about Wanda. Why ain't you dead yet? You know, <laughs> and that humor boy. I mean, again, not too many people you're going to find with that that kind of humor. Uh, maybe like yeah. Fran Ross, if y'all know who she is, she used to write for Richard Pryor in the 70s. She wrote like this book called Oreo. Same uh, kind of thing. Like, you just can't find a channel like that. Like, I mean, we all know black women are hilarious, but like what's our adjacent Richard Pryor in the in the Canada or in the world? It's like, it might be Wanda Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so exactly. Funny. So funny. That good salt. <laughs> mm -hmm. That good salt. Yeah. Um, all right, you guys. Uh, does anyone else have any questions or things they want to, I guess, 
leave with before we before we get out of here. Um, I'm just grateful to be here online with you guys. I wish we were all hugging in real life um, in a room. Hey. I know that'll happen again. We'll do it again someday. And hey, did uh, you see? Uh, did you see Bob Holman ask the question? I think we. Had, I just went to the Q and A when you were like, yeah, you like sure. Oh. It's not that many, so we won't be here long. Uh, Wanda was one of the greatest readers I've ever heard. I call her a trance poet. Can you speak about her performance from Bob? Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, I think Patricia spoke about that a little bit. Um, we, you know, we did a series in Los Angeles. I produced a poetry series for several years called "The Drums Inside Your Chest." I'm pretty sure the only two people who on here who haven't done that are Dorothy Lasky and you, Terrence. But every pretty much any LA poet or most poets had done it. And it was kind of like a variety show where, um, you know, we would showcase different poets um, from uh, from all over the country who were, you know, different ages, different backgrounds, different voices. Um, and everybody would do like, you know, uh, roughly like eight to 10 minutes. And then we would usually have like somebody, in, like a palate cleanser in between. And it was, it was a way we were trying to bring more people into poetry and to uh, broaden the, um, the, the, the viewership and the fan base of, of modern poets. We had Jack Hirschman, we have, um, my God, I feel like we had everybody, Andrea Gibson, um, so, so many people, I can't even think at this point, but Wanda did it one year too. And I remember that speaking about her performance, um, we both see, uh, um, we, speaking about her performance, we had, um, she, she performed, I remember, and I ha still have this, photo it's actually downstairs in my living room on the wall it's like a big photo of wanda with a chair sitting next to her with her book on top of it and she's standing she always had her hair up and she always had pencils sticking up in it <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and she wore these glasses and uh well you could always like have a pen or a pencil if you had them available in her hair and this poem and this photo she's like this and there's spit just flying out of her mouth mid moment and she's like this with her hand against her forehead and she's like in this middle of saying a poem um and i from all the years we did drums i think we did drums for drums inside your chest for seven years um wanda that performance remained like the one that people most talked about she really was as patricia said so captivating she could you could hear a pin drop in the room when she performed she just took you in and she also in, in some of the ways that some of the greatest poets which are all of you included here um especially you rachel and uh you patricia where you you women can change the course of an entire reading like normally there's a format in which we you know for anyone who, who runs shows or or produces poetry events or shows you have a format you have certain types of poet re poets to read first whatever that is but there are great, great poets um, who can just change it, no matter what it is. Even if someone before you has read something that's fallen flat, they're not a great reader, you know, or even they're like super funny, and now you're going to go into a dark poem, a dark set. Um, and Wanda was one of those types of people. She was her own show. She got on a stage, and when she performed, she was the show. And we were all sort of like lucky to be there alongside her, but I don't think I have ever seen anything like that. Um, someone who was just able to be their own poetry experience. Uh, mm -hmm. She just blew me away every single time. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because we both grew up, like I grew up on a, acting on a soap opera for seven years when I was a kid. And Wanda was a writer of soap operas. And she really understood yeah. drama. Yeah, she was. I think she was a writer for All My Children or something. Yeah, she won an Emmy. She got an Emmy for it. And most people don't know that, but screenplay. like, we need this Wanda Coleman movie. I'm telling you, I know, I know, but like, that was one of the first things we bonded over was the objectification of the business, um, of also the the unreality of it, um, the bullshit. Uh, and she was, I think, she had, she really understood drama and how to pull people in. And to me, the great poets like everyone here on this, you know, in this session are the, are the ones who can meld and combine those two things, which is the dramatic performance with the spectacular, like searing writing. And when you have those two things combined, people are just putty in your hands, period. Mm -hmm. And she had that in spades. Well, she also, she was so married to integrity, you know, mm -hmm. and authenticity. And I think that 
when you step onto a stage and you have your poems with you that aren't academically polished. And, and you know, I say this as someone who I've never even went to college, um, but like understanding that like these are poems that will have to inhabit your body for a moment or two, you know, the true duende. And I feel like that that's exactly what she would do. You would just watch a, a body jump happen. Uh, and uh, I really admire that type of stuff because there's like that slight uneasiness. Um, there's some uncertainty around that. And uh, that's the kind of reading I want to be present for is mm -hmm. to see someone truly allow the spirit of their art to leap into their body and come out as spittle and, you know, heretic fucking shadow and all Spit of that me. good thing. <laughs> no, enchantment. Glory. Letter, all of it, yeah. Wicked enchantment. Yeah. <laughs> Wicked enchantment, it's the perfect title. Um, does anybody else that's watching have any more questions? We got a couple more minutes. I guess I should have said that at the very top if people wanted to submit questions. Mm -hmm. Um, Someone asked how you first met Wanda, Amber. Say again? Someone asked how you first met Wanda. Oh, I met Wanda um, at Beyond Baroque when I would read there a bunch when I was um, maybe like 13, 14, 15, really young. Um, I grew up around a lot of poets uh, living in Los Angeles, Jack Hirschman and um, Diane DePrima and Mary Baraka. And those were frequent uh, poets that were in my household, in my apartment co courtyard complex, reading and drinking and and being. I was like the real bohemian uh, Southern California kid. Um, so I, I met her there and I met her uh, reading at Beyond Broke and, um, and we just, like two of the most different human beings, upbringings, lives in the whole world and we just connected and I think, um, my first book uh, was called Free Stallion, and it came out on Simon & Schuster when I was about 21. And it was a collection of poems I had written as, as a teenager. Um, and a lot of those poems were really, really influenced by Wanda. Um, I used to go to her house. Um, she lived out for a while near uh, LAX airport. Um, she had a house there. Where she lived with her husband, Austin. And I used to go out there and read and write with her. And... Um, she was a true mentor for many, many years. And then I moved to New York in my mid twenties and we sort of peripherally lost touch for a little while. Um, and then when she passed away, I think, you know, we were talking about that. Rachel was, you know, saying, agreeing that we sort of all sort of took her for granted. Um, I feel like every city sort of has their staple poet, has their queen or king or whoever that is. And I do feel like Wanda was that, but she wasn't given a lot of that due respect, which is, I think she was highly aware of that and she wrote from it. Um, so I feel a lot of guilt for that, um, but not as much because I feel like so many wonderful people like Terrence and, um, and everyone is, has been so willing to continue her legacy and continue her voice. But that's where I met her. I met her in, in LA, in Venice, um, reading poems. Uh, she just, she was a great mentor and a great friend. Uh, Patricia, weren't you there in 2001 at that thing at the Schomburg? That's where I first met her. Uh, Mary Baraka read, Roger Bonaregard, Stacey Ann Chen. Weren't you one of the readers there too? Do you remember that? Or is that, is that a ridiculous question to ask when you remember all the readings you've given? <laughs> <laughs> I realize all there's the shows you've I'm got. the person who's read everywhere. But yeah. I think no, it was, it was I, I, I actually do think I was there. I think you were too, 75th anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just only bring that up. That was my first time meeting her, but I, I bring that up because after she passed, all of her stuff was in storage and Austin was watching her husband and then he passed and then they stopped paying on it and it was just sort of out in the street and Amber, right, you found out about it and after a whole bunch of work, uh, we got to the Schomburg, what we could recover, there was a lot that was lost. Well, what we could recover got to the Schomburg. So I say that's just a beautiful loop uh, to think about her getting back oh, there and, the, and their that's care. Right. We were talking about that at, at AWP, that right. time that, the, okay. Kevin, Kevin. Yeah, it was, it was Kevin one of the craziest that. stories ever where Kate Gale from Red Hen mm -hmm. had emailed through like a sec third party or something saying that someone who I think worked 
was like an assist, uh, 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 somebody who was, who was volunteering at the press or something had happened upon these boxes that were left out in the rain and just happened to like look at one of them and saw the name Wanda Coleman on it, on it wow. called Kate. I think, I'm get, I think I'm getting this closely correct. <laughs> but it was something like that where you just are like, how does that happen? And what had happened was, from what I understand, her family had put, like, basically they wanted to close down the storage unit she had of all her writing and this. They, like, trashed a lot of it. Um, and we were able to, Kate was able to send us, like, 10 boxes, which we um, we had shipped, Kate shipped them here to New York, and uh, Kevin Young and I went through them, spent several days going through them and pulling out the work that was salvageable to be archived at Schomburg, which um, is actually there. So if anybody is in yeah. New York, you know, once all this... Um, uh, 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 you know, self quarantining and staying inside has lifted. I encourage anyone to go see it because some of one, a lot of Wanda's work is archived there, which is extraordinary. But that's sort of where it all really started. And I reached out to Terrence and I said, What are we going to do with this work? It's here. And we've been trying to get it before. It's like uh, it's such a long, painful story, but, you know, but we got it. Yeah. Good for you. Oh, wait, we'll go back. We'll find it. We'll go. Yeah. <laughs> So we're calling this the void, sea yeah. void. This would make a great stage play. For it life. really would. Mm -hmm. That's right. Get Wonderful play. play. <laughs> um, all right, you guys. I think we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you, Anna. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. I see a lot of really great comments, too, from people saying, um, t talking about how they first encountered Wanda and also just grateful to learn about her for the first time, which was kind of the point of doing this. We're, we're so excited. So uh, anyone that's that's um, still on with us, please, just a reminder, go order this book. Go online. You can order it from any bookstore. You can find it. You can go to godine.com. That's G-O-D-I-N-E.com. You can find information. It's a beautiful collection of, of selected poems um, edited and introduced by Terrence Hayes, who's here with us. There's the books. Um, thank you, Rachel McKibbins, Patricia Smith, Dorothy Lasky, Mahogany Terrence, Joshua. Um, we are so honored to be here and read with you guys. And um, look at that. So beautiful. Look at how gorgeous she is. Um, we hope you buy the book and we hope you read her poems. Much love, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye, you guys. Be safe. Bye, Terrence. Bye, Dorothea. Bye. 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 Love you. Bye, all. Love you all. Bye, all. Bye. Bye, Joshua. Bye, bye. Bye, Daddy. Bye, congratulations. You taking care of yourself, Daddy? Yeah. Yeah, are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm making it. <laughs> nice, to see you. nice to see you. I'll see you another time. Yeah, <laughs> Less public. Yeah. Okay. Bye, 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 bye.